The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Lisa Myers with ARX Healthcare in Franklin, Tennessee. I want to thank you all for joining us today. I want to let you know that we've posted the slides on our website. You can find the link in the GoToWebinar chat box. I have a few announcements before we get started. Registration will be open shortly for our next webinar, which is on January 10th. You can visit tnhfma.org forward slash webinars for more information. We would also like for you to save the date for our annual Kelly Miller Payer Summit. That will be held March 27th through the 30th in 2017. And again, if you'll visit, visit our website, we will have more information on, on that coming up. Requirements to obtain CPE certificates today. You must be connected to the webinar for at least 90% of the duration. You must respond to at least two-thirds two of the polling questions. So today we have Glenn Kraus. He is Dermed's Regional Director of Enterprise Solutions. Glenn brings more than 20 years as a professional in the health information management field to his work at Dermed. Previously, he held executive and consulting positions, including Revenue Systems Manager, CDI Director of both inpatient and outpatient programs, Director of Case Management and Revenue Enhancement, Director of Health Information Management, Corporate Director of Clinical Coding, and Data Quality Manager with major U.S. hospital and health systems nationwide. He has successfully implemented numerous outpatient CDI programs at multi-hospital systems throughout the country with notable recognized returns while engaging physicians in achieving true documentation excellence through consistent adherence to best practice standards of clinical documentation. So with that being said, Glenn, thank you so much for being with us today, and I will thank turn you. it over to you. All right. Uh, greetings, folks. Uh, I'm actually in Vermont, so good afternoon, but good morning if you're in Tennessee. Uh, uh, I want to jump right in and uh, to our objectives. Uh, if you have any questions, please save them for the end. I think there's a chat box. Am I correct? Uh, to actually post some of the questions, and we'll be glad to you are correct. answer. Thank you. Answer as many as possible. Uh, and if we don't get to all the questions, or if you do have questions that come up, uh, after the presentation, my contact information is in the last slide. Uh, please don't hesitate. I will respond to every uh, email or telephone call. So uh, let's go quickly over the objectives. If we want to understand the fundamental framework and key provisions of CDI initiatives, which, they, which serve as the basis for success and measurable, meaningful return on investment, and uh, uh, I, 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 I wholeheartedly uh, uh, I'm convinced that at present, at present, our CDI programs today are not truly aligned or integrated with our, uh, our revenue cycle in some, in some, in, uh, in some, uh, in some fashion or in some consideration. They're, they're kind of counterintuitive or counterproductive to our actual return on investment and, and, and uh, revenue cycle in terms of generating good, uh, solid revenue with integrity. And I want to outline the pitfalls of traditional CDI programs and identify opportunities to engage positions more, uh, more effectively and, and efforts that, CDI efforts that really support the overall revenue cycle process. Uh, I want to kind of outline some of the key KPIs that we're using today versus some, uh, some that, I, that I feel very strongly are more uh, reliable measure and valid measure of our return on investment. And I, and I want to also uh, introduce the concept of a proactive approach to denials avoidance. And I would like to say really denials avoidance, because denials management is repetitive transactional. Let's go ahead and really capitalize on our ability to transform CDI into a proactive approach that actually reduces denials and, and uh, uh, alleviates some of the unnecessary self-inflicted avoidable denials. And lastly, you want to learn how to realign and more closely integrate CDI with the revenue cycle, and, and how do I engage our clinicians in a culture, a transformational culture, and uh, use CDI as a catalyst for denial avoidance. So let's get started on slide number four. Uh, and I, one thing I want to say is when you may not uh, review all the slides, but they're, they're, I put them in there for excellent reference uh, to return back to uh, after the presentation. and I. I and also, there's an appendix with some great information about the standards of documentation and what should an H&P and a progress note and a discharge summary look like. You can share those with your CDI professionals or management. So let's look at the purpose. I think one of the things that really detracts from CDI today is the communication of care. Uh, we don't 
we've kind of gotten away from recognizing that documentation serves first and foremost as a communication of care rendered to the patient. And if you look at these bullet points I have here, we do have res reimbursement and revenue cycle processes, and that should be the outcome, not the, that should be a strong outcome of uh, processes of documentation improvement. And every one of these elements here, measures of efficiency and outcomes and quality and uh, continuity of care is based on good, solid documentation, which I'm going to define uh, in, in this presentation. Plus, I have a case study which shows what happens when we have insufficient documentation. <clears throat> This is William Osler on slide number five. And the reason why I put this in there, because he was the father of John Hopkins residency program. First doctor to realize that best training of physicians comes on the floor with real patients. <clears throat> but one of his claims of fame was, uh, was he, what he called observe, record, tabulate, and communicate. And that's nothing has changed since the 1860s when he was actually practicing medicine. And they, actually, the electronic health record has really, in my mind, uh, kind of detracted from the actual communication of patient care, which I'm going to uh, demonstrate in the case study for you. So transforming the CDI means recognizing some of our insufficiencies and limitations uh, of the current process and how they detract from uh, actually solid uh, documentation that supports the revenue cycle. So on slide number seven, uh, I want to uh, focus on PDI, and I call that physician documentation improvement because I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting the sense or I'm convinced that what we're, what we're doing today is really uh, 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 what I call CRI, clinical reimbursement improvement. Uh, we're just focusing on the diagnoses uh, a diagnosis that impact the reimbursement. What we're not focusing on is educating physicians and giving them, uh, providing them information and actionable knowledge that they can use to improve documentation. And I'm going to show you how we can do that with the same staff that we have today with no additional cost. So let's, and the other thing is we're really focusing on the outcomes of, okay, we leave a query. Uh, or we, we, we speak to a physician, they write a diagnosis, very transactional in nature after we review a record, identify opportunities, uh, but we're not fixing the process of actual documentation. And I, and I say that because uh, when I do my presentations to physicians or uh, to, uh, to CDI specialists, I always ask to start off the presentation by asking a question, how many of you are still getting queries or, or are querying for its congestive heart failure, the QQ on chronic systolic diastolic combination. The code has been around for seven years. We're still asking for the same specificity. So obviously, we haven't fixed the process of documentation. So the current framework in slide eight is basically review charts, leave queries, wait for a response, uh, log our response in our uh, database so we can track and trend well, how we're doing from a uh, uh, KPI indication indicators, and we uh, we we impact coding and MSD enhancement, uh, and we suppose we have a positive case mix and reimbursement effect. And I put an asterisk under the positive because unfortunately I, I don't uh, I don't think the C suite or the CFOs, and I'm not being negative, just being honest, don't don't have a strong appreciation for it. just because you're built for something doesn't mean you get paid for it. So if we're using case mix increases as a measure of uh, KPIs for our program, it doesn't really, it's not a valid and reliable, it's not a re valid and reliable K, uh, KPI because uh, you need to be looking at net, net, K, uh, net case mix, which means subtract our denials, clinical validation denials, and medical necessity, which I'll kind of outline in just in a few slides. So let's take a look at slide number nine. We have the current framework. And I, I'm just throwing it out there for consideration. Uh, today we have a patient encounter, uh, okay, which can be an admission, which is an admission, is it an asset or a liability? And uh, my case study will drive that point home. So just because we have a head and a bed doesn't necessarily mean that it's an asset. Uh, it could be a liability. Uh, the process is the chart review, and we're looking for CCs or MCCs, co comorbid conditions and major CCs, for principal diagnosis, solidification, and specification. We're looking for a, a hospital uh, HCCs if you're uh, for the Medicare Advantage program. Uh, you're looking for hospital quiet conditions to be sure we can answer them yes or no, and looking for patient safety indicators. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. 
but the outcome is uh, is is actually documentation and coding. The the outcome of our the uh, the uh, documentation coding is the outcome, but unfortunately, the documentation improvement is not necessarily uh, something we focus on from a process point of view. So as you can see, we're really outcomes based. We're not changing physician behavior, and I'm going to kind of outline what happens when we don't change behavior of the clinical facts clinical information and content, it leads to denials and clinical validation, very painful, which is obviously not, not, not supporting the revenue cycle. So let's look at slide 10. Don't ask what's wrong, ask what's missing. So really what's missing uh, is how do, we, how do we impact physician behavior and engagement uh, to really focus on documentation improvement uh, to the extent that the record speaks for itself. How do we change the structure and format of CDI uh, to really focus on documentation improvement in the process? And I'm going to outline some key, key points to consider in your facility or questions to ask to raise people's awareness. On slide number 11, OK, so what are the missing elements? Well, we don't, as I mentioned, we have issues of uh, deficiencies in actual process improvement of documentation. We haven't changed position documentation behaviors, uh, which I'm going to outline what steps we need to do or consider. We don't have an encompassing bird's eye view. And what I mean by that is once, we, once the CDI person uh, queries a position and they respond positively, uh, 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 we log it in our, in our database. And what we don't, we don't have, we don't have any good appreciation or we don't get any feedback from our denials and appeals department of any any issues of denials or down coding or clinical validation denials. Uh, and uh, they, we, we should have a bird's eye view because if we, we CD, uh, CDI should be a continuous quality improvement. And I, I'm going to go over my case study, which really is going to drive everything at the one point. And we're not closely aligned and integrated with revenue cycle. So one of some of the limitations on slide 12 is epi uh, we're episodic, we're repetitive, we're only uh, focusing on the low-hanging fruit of CCs and CCs. We have a narrow scope. Uh, we're not addressing documentation insufficiencies and inconsistencies. Uh, and you know, uh, every year Medicare, when they release the third, uh, third contractor error rate, uh, usually comes out in November. Uh, it, the, the point is always made very clearly that the majority of denial, medical necessity denials, are due to ins insufficient documentation. Uh, and the name of our profession is clinical documentation improvement. And, uh, and, and we often have some inconsistencies in documentation that we do not address as part of the CDI. I actually have a case study I want to show you. So uh, focusing on the process, changing our approach and mindset, which I'm going to outline really, which will really transform the CDI process and our KPIs reimbursed and focused. So on the next slide, I just kind of cover a couple of things. Uh, we're not, we, are, we, have, we have specific uh, really uh, detrimental uh, challenging issues with progress notes with cut and paste that detract from medical necessity. We're focusing on buzzwords like acute respiratory failure without getting the clinical facts and the, and the uh, content of the chart solidified. And we're, when, and one of the really, I believe, the biggest challenge we have or a lot of process limitation is that when we're not looking at our data after the fact because we know the OIG and the RAC and the MAC contractors, they have sophisticated data mining and computer matching uh, capabilities with their software, would employ a host of data scientists to develop these uh, algorithms. Uh, and they identify high risk areas, which they continue to do in the OIG uh, the OIG's uh, hospital compliance reviews, and it was actually reinforced in the OIG work plan that they're going to continue to uh, focus on high-risk DRGs and high-risk hospitals. And this data comes from, uh, from from data mining and computer matching. So we need to really have give some consideration to a software out there that will level the playing fields. And we have a potential for increased medical necessity denials because uh, we're not focusing on medical necessity uh, for uh, particular missions. We're, focus, we're focusing primarily on the diagnosis. And I'm going to outline some steps, that we, key steps we can take to avoid that. OK? Uh, Lisa, would you mind with the, uh, we have some polling questions. So if you wouldn't mind asking the first one, I would very much appreciate it. Sure thing. So our first polling question, how do you currently measure the performance of your CDI program? 
case mix index, number of queries and physician response to queries, CC, MCC capture rate, A, B, and C, or unsure. We'll give everyone just a few minutes to vote on that. Okay. It'll be interesting to see what the response is. Just a reminder for those of you that need CPE certificates, you must be responding to at least two-thirds of the polling questions. We've got about 76% that have voted so far. And the answer is, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and close that poll and okay. share the results with everyone. 10% say case mix index, 0% uh -huh. for number of queries, about 10% yes. say CC and CC capture rate, 40% okay. A, B, and C, and about 40% are unsure. Okay, that's well, I figured that would be the response, uh, obviously. And so, the, uh, can, you pull, can you put that back up, uh, Lisa, if you don't mind? Sure thing. Can you do that? So, yeah, uh, uh, the actual the, my uh, in my mind the most accurate answer was A, B, and C, forty percent. Uh, and uh, uh, while while it's important to keep on track of our case mix index and our CC MCC capture rate uh, and our number of queries, because there is a standard of uh, each hospital has a standard of queries and responses to queries. Uh, they don't really. They don't really accurately depict uh, the, uh, the outcome or the successes I'm going to go into in the next couple of slides. What should be our KPIs? What should be our key performance indicators? Okay, you can take that down. So the some of the limiting factors, or we're not going to go away. You can read these on your own. Let's see if I can get my slide to move here. Okay, so what are other limitations? Uh, our preoccupation with outcomes, the after effect, we, we, we're not following the Deficiencies that are developed after the fact, I call that risk and trailing impact, which I go into. There's a cognitive bias to the doctors to answer the query and perhaps leave out some of the additional uh, possibilities of diagnosis. And there's an impediment to revenue cycle because I'm seeing a big rash of denials for clinical validation, which we'll go into. Uh, and, the, and the next slide. Uh, I just want to highlight some of the DRGs that are under active scrutiny. They're considered high-risk DRGs because of their high weight and payment. And these are some of the payments that uh, uh, we had in 2013, latest data. Uh, and so these are some of the these are some of the DRGs that our program should be really focusing on to ensure we have good, solid documentation, and the documentation meets the standards which I'm going to define. So let's look at slide 18. What we have is uh, so uh, a bed census is something rather important uh, to a hospital's uh, 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 financial success or operations. However, bed census could be an uh, asset and liability because if we don't have optimal documentation of medical necessity, clinical judgment, and medical decision making, uh, which I'm going to define, so really supporting the coding and billing from the standpoint of facts. Uh, why the patient was admitted, what was the status of the patient, and so forth, we will not receive optimal reimbursement because we may not get paid based on medical necessity or DRG changes. So here are some of the KPIs that I have associated with that first polling question. And, and if you look at some of the number of cases reviewed by the CDI person, number of cases queried, uh, percentage of cases queried, and so forth, uh, these, these should be our secondary KPIs, not our primary. And uh, number 20, slide 20, we have secondary diagnosis additions. Like, OK, uh, did, they, did, did the secondary diagnosis that we queried for that was coded, does it impact revenue, yes or no? Uh, does it impact the severity of ill risk, mortality scores, number of charts touched, and so forth? So uh, and on slide 21, some additional current KPIs. Uh, so what are the potential KPIs? What can we use for KPIs? And I'm going to list some of them. I'm not going to go through all of them. But if you look at net monthly case mix trends, so what is our case mix for the month minus any medical necessity denials? If we get, if the CDI is being judged based on our case mix total, we shouldn't get credit or we should not, we should back out any denials that we receive from medical necessity. And, uh, and what's our adjusted net patient revenue? So 
take our monthly net patient revenue and subtract our medical necessity miles, net patient revenue, that gives us a better handle of how our CDI program is performing. And uh, what is our clinical validation denials? Now, I'm going to define what clinical validation denials for those, those who uh, need a brushing up on that. Uh, it's when we bill for a secondary diagnosis or a principal diagnosis that it obviously impacts reimbursement for a DRG standpoint, and the insurance companies say they don't, they don't believe, despite the documentation by the doctor that was queried by the CDI specialist, uh, they, don't, they don't, based on the clinical facts and information of the case, uh, do not agree with, that, agree with that diagnosis and take it away. Uh, and, and I'm going to go over a case study of exactly what happened uh, and how a chart was uh, actually uh, 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 identified by the third-party payer a year after they paid the claim and what happens when we have clinical validation denials. So some other potential KPIs could be number of queries, post-coding, and waiting response to retrospective query. So if we have, we know that discharge final bill is a very important metric for, uh, for the finances of the hospital cash flow. And if we have queries that are waiting, awaiting response that uh, may have been queried by the CDI, well, that's, that's obviously impacting cash, uh, acceleration of cash. That should be our number, that should be a potential KBI. And in, in the dollars, post-coding, so number of queries in the dollars, and then monthly total amount of clinical validation denials, and what is our total and dollar amount of medical necessity denials? Because through my years of experience, I uh, can appreciate that uh, a good H&P which we should be focusing on uh, will reduce a lot of these medical necessity denials. And one other thing I want to bring to your attention is anytime we bill a Medicare claim and we want to, we can, and we get paid and we find a query that was responded to or we have an audit and we show that we had a, maybe a uh, overlooking of the appropriate codes or additional diagnosis in the query process, uh, we should be really looking at, at those cases because the QIO BSE QIO, they look at the their out their, their, their scope of practice or mandate is to look at every case that's rebuilt uh, and determine whether the patient uh, met medical necessity, quality, and safety. And if they meet those two screens, they uh, they will uh, look at the coding. Uh, so you're opening up uh, the hospital to potential non-payment by sending those in. We should be looking at the documentation before we send it in. So let's look at slide 25. Here's where I want to introduce my case study. Okay, so this is our net patient revenue leakage. We have technical denials such as um, uh, timely filing, patient not, not insured, uh, benefits started after the, uh, after the uh, discharge date and so forth, um, uh, uh, whereas whether secondary insurance, bill the primary, uh, this is a, uh, a auto accident. So let's look at our denials that, that, that are impacted by documentation. We have clinical validation denials. We have retrospective denials. Uh, we have concurrent denials on the floor uh, when the patient's still in the house. And we have medical necessity denials. So it, all of these elements aside, uh, besides technical are impacted by CDI. And I want to kind of introduce this case study. So a colleague of mine out west asked me if I look at some uh, one patient who had three uh, admissions within a month. No reflection of, of bad care, no quality of care issues. A very sick elderly, 85-year-old male patient who was admitted to, the, uh, admitted to the hospital actually from the doctor's office, uh, didn't feel well, was just discharged from a hospital five days, another hospital five days ago, uh, with uh, pneumonia and acute CHF. Then into the doctor's office, the doctor said, you don't belong here, called the ambulance, admitted the patient, went to the ICU, we had a patient with sepsis, uh, a, a, a severe sepsis with organ failure, the acute renal failure, tubal necrosis, respiratory failure, encephalopathy, chronic renal failure, stage five. A wonderful care was discharged in stable condition. Wonderful discharge summary that showed the stability of the patient. They went to a sniff, came back five days later with a supposed UTI, uh, and also had encephalopathy, or that's a, you know a change in mental status is associated with an infection of the UTI that. Uh, uh, the CDI person queried the doctor for encephalopathy, which was really not a valid query because it's associated and expected. It's expected with a UTI in, in most patients, or at least depending on the degree of UTI and their immune status. Uh, and so uh, that was that was billed and paid. 
Uh, and then the patient went back to the sniff, and then a third time came in uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with sepsis uh, uh, and uh, acute respiratory failure and malnutrition. Uh, and this is a frail elderly patient with a litany of chronic conditions who ended up dying, and no quality of care issues. So the insurance company, when I call risk and failing impact, they actually reviewed the case uh, a year later. One year later, which they had reserved the right to do, and said, we don't believe this encephalopathy is clinically supported. Let's take it away. So they took it away and saved themselves $8,000 in reimbursement. Then they looked at the case further and saw that the diagnosis of encephalopathy was the same diagnosis that was that was uh, uh, used as a secondary diagnosis uh, of 10 days ago, or eight to 10 days ago prior, okay? Uh, and so they decided they didn't want to pay for the entire stay. So that was uh, that was a, a net patient revenue of $48,000 that they want back. And then on the third third admission, uh, uh, they they don't want they didn't pay the third admission, okay? So what happened was we queried for a diagnosis that was not supported by the documentation. Uh, the h &P was very insufficient and indicated the patient had a, uh, was diagnosed early in the week with, uh, with a UTI, didn't have any uh, signs or symptoms exhibited by the documentation of the UTI. Uh, and the doctor wrote uh, two hours after the patient was admitted, pa uh, uh, a patient admitted with a UTI and CHF, uh, acute encephalopathy resolved. Okay, so there's no way that diagnosis was supported by the clinical validation. And because it was the only major CC in the chart, they used their data analytics and have a sc clinical uh, uh, a screen in place where they actually review every case or seek uh, to look at the case beforehand, usually, and don't pay for that. So this is how we started on a case that was wound up in a denial from a clinical validation and ended up costing the hospital lots of money because their net patient their gross patient revenue in all these cases was 320,000. Um, I think 323 or something like that, and they only got paid for the first one was 50,000. So they really lost their shirt on that. So this is a perfect example of how CDI does not align and integrate. Uh, has a tendency not to integrate. So what should we be doing to fix this problem? Is to focus on this is what the focus should be in our documentation improvement. The right care at the right time at the right reason with the right documentation in the right venue with the right clinical judgment and medical decision making. And if you look at all these bullet points, the, the, the common theme in all these bullet points is the right documentation. Not more, just more effective. And that's something we need to embrace as CDI specialists and inter, uh, interject into our program. So let's, uh, I want to kind of skip over this slide. Let's go over to slide number 28. So well, how do we define effective and complete documentation? This is one of the standards that we should be achieving. It's concise, no fluff, uh, because the EHR allows a lot of cut and paste and carry forwards that do not add value to the particular admission in terms of acuity. And so when we talk about accurate reporting of acuity, uh, every record should meet this standard. A nature of the presenting problem is our history of present illness. And we're not focusing on H and P, as I'll go into in a minute. We should have a chief complaint. We should have an accurate history of present illness, not past illness. And by the way, one of the limitations of these, the, the, that second admission was the, the HPI was more focused on the past illness and did not give a good picture of what brought this patient to the ER. That was a big detrimental factor. And do we have a physical exam that's reflective of the patient's presentation? Uh, and and we're looking at the clinical specificity of our diagnosis and our assessment, but the real challenge that we had is we're looking at it after the fact. Which, uh, in other words, part of our role as CDI in any program is to review the case 24 to 48 hours after the patient's admitted. Well, that's too late. That's reactive. Uh, our expectation of really what we should transform is a proactive approach of looking at this documentation. And documentation improvement really should be started in the ER because it's, it's the segue to admission. Uh, and is the diagnosis relevant to the patient encounter? Uh, and can we trace back our diagnosis with the right specificity from the beginning in our H&P to any signs or symptoms or the reason for admission and as evident in the ER documentation in the H&P? 
that's a big limiting factor that leads to self-inflicted medical necessity denial that does not support the revenue cycle. And is our plan of care congruent with the assessment? So on slide 29, I would say this is a very, very important slide. Because the medical record, what, what, what should be the content of the record? It should not only should be the diagnosis. It's considered complete if it contains sufficient, not more, just sufficient documentation to identify the patient, support the diagnosis. Like, OK, if I have a diagnosis of acute encephalopathy, do I have a good description of a patient with all the mental status and what was the context and how long and what precipitated it and did the patient have a history of it? Uh, do we have do we have uh, 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 a good H and P or in progress notes any symptomatology to justify the treatment? And and does our progress notes truly indicate progress of the patient or lack thereof? Does it document the course and results of treatment? Does it show is the patient getting better? Is the patient getting worse? Because these are the things that the case manager needs or a uh, UM person needs to call into the insurance company. And does it facilitate continuity of care? So the medical record is sufficiently detailed if, uh, if, it, if it allows a responsible practitioner to provide continuing care. So it, uh, to determine later what the patient's condition was at a specified time, and review diagnostic therapeutic procedures performed in patient's response. And really, the, the gold standard is, can a physician pick up a chart and continue the same quality care that the, and know exactly what's happening uh, when, uh, when I assume care? So can my hospitalist who's a nocturnist at night or been off, and been off duty for seven days, seven on, seven off, can they pick up the chart and not have to read the entire chart? This is what the standard should be. And now I, when I when I on slide 30 when I when I do my presentations or have a conversation with CDI directors at hospitals or managers, I always ask what's the objectives, goals, and values. And oftentimes I don't even have this. This is fundamental to our program. What are we trying to achieve? Uh, and I say value statement by is securing a thorough, complete, and accurate patient health record. We will check and achieve the correct reimbursement for resource utilization, the highest quality measures and outcomes, superior communication between providers, and ultimately the high patient satisfaction. And if you look at today's environment of, of moving away from fee for service to fee for value, uh, really the communication of patient care and the accuracy of the and reflection of the severity of the patient's care and why the patient's there is going to become even more more uh, uh, ultimately more important because we're not going to get paid based on a head in the bed or a hanging of a bag of chemo in the outpatient if do we have the right setting with in the right with the right care at the right time and are we keeping patients healthy and only uh, serving those patients who truly have a need for for care and establishing medical necessity so these are the things that we should be really focusing on and another point I want to make before I move forward is that this is a good time to say, okay, let's look at our medical necessity denials in an inpatient and outpatient from a documentation standpoint because really uh, 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 medical necessity uh, today or even tomorrow, uh, what, we, what we build today is going to impact what we receive tomorrow. And if you think about medical necessity denials, it potentially means that we provided a service that may have not been justified. Uh, uh, maybe there are some uh, some things that were ordered that may may be nice to know, but but don't change our management of the patient. Or we we have documentation insufficiencies, which if we're going to get paid a global payment based on effectiveness and efficiency, we need to be sure we're ordering the right tests at the right time with the right documentation. So let's look at our medical necessity not only from a standpoint of immediate gain for revenue, is changing the pattern, is changing changing the the, the goals or the patterns of how we order and why we order. So how do we move the needle on CDI? How do we change the framework to a new paradigm? Well, it's, I believe CDI should be defined by the completeness, consistency, organization, and accuracy of the medical record, reflecting the physician's clinical judgment and medical decision making. And we support positive outcomes in patient care, quality, cost, resource, consumption, fee for value, patient reimbursement, and revenue cycle processes by actually improving documentation. And I think this would be a good time to have another polling question. All righty, so our next polling question. Does your CDI staff receive feedback on and actively participate in medical necessity and other coding-related denial?
should be an easy one. Yes or no, well, I'm sure. Correct. Sounds like Looks like we have about 76% that have voted. So again, just a reminder, to receive CPE certificates for today, you must respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions. We'll give everyone well, another 30 seconds or so to respond. Make sure we get the majority so responding. If I remind you of taking a test in college, it could be <laughs> A, B, or C, or D, or E, and they try to fool you, remember? All right, so we have 84% voted. I'm going to go ahead and close that and share okay. the results with you, Glenn. Yeah, go ahead. So 48% say yes, 19% say no, and 33% are unsure. Okay, well, I figured that would be the kind of response. And I'm glad that we have almost uh, almost 50% that say yes. Uh, we want to be sure that when we when we get the measures of denial sent back to our CDI, that they know, uh, they, they, they understand uh, or have a good concept of what's missing from the chart. Uh, and I'm going to kind of go over what things should we be looking for up front, because there's no sense in having repetitive, repetitive denials for the same thing. Okay, let's move on to the next. Okay, thank you. Appreciate everyone answering. I'm also going to get my computer to work here. Here we go. So I want to focus just a little bit on slide number 32, okay? Uh, physicians focus on, I call this AW principles of documentation, and this should be something that uh, uh, we in, in, instill in our chart reviews and, and have as our understanding and kind of a foundation for chart reviews. Uh, this was vested in uh, probably 20 physician colleagues of mine. Uh, that believe that if we focused on on educating physicians and working with our physician advisor advisors as champions uh, to affect okay uh, there's a documentation and the physicians understand the eight W's of, of uh, capturing in their H and P and their progress notes we would alleviate uh, quite a lot of our den unnecessary denials. So let's look at slide number 33. Eight W principle. How do we operationalize it? Okay. So on the right hand side. I put in there uh, exactly where where we should be focusing as CDI specialists. What is the framework that we need to be following to transform our CDI reactive approach? If, if so if we look at uh, focus upon capturing these elements, you'll see that the HPI, the where is the patient been, where is the patient now, and what are you thinking? That's on our assessment. Why am I thinking? Where am I going? Uh, and what what were the results of the test when after the results came back? Because oftentimes uh, the physician will see that say a will will see and will recognize an abnormal finding such as a right lower lobe infiltrate, meaning maybe aspiration pneumonia. Start the patient on antibiotics, but he doesn't give us his clinical rationale in his assessment. Just gives a diagnosis that we query for, and unfortunately we need that information of. Okay, how did I arrive at a diagnosis, and what led me to believe? Just the fact that an X-ray is blown into a into a progress note or populates automatically doesn't mean the doctor actually saw it. So these are the seven things that we should be incorporating into our CDI program with the help of our physician advisors. And actually, on slide 34, we haven't covered that. For some reason, I have it twice. So let's look at communication and patient care in 35. We have clinical. We have the patient care. The clinical judgment and medical decision making, uh, if we work with physicians to uh, to promote and achieve the capture of that, we have excellent communication of communication and patient care that supports medical necessity. And I want to kind of define clinical judgment because I've used that term quite often. It's actually the assessment, the physician's assessment of a patient's particular clinical scenario, and the use of the information and and the use of information uh, to initiate a plan of care that's congruent with the assessment. And so, and oftentimes, believe it or not, we have physicians who write down a diagnosis where I don't even have any idea where it came from. There was no signs of symptoms. That diagnosis in encephalopathy is a perfect example. And medical decision making is the complexity of coming up with a diagnosis. And that's something we don't necessarily focus on. We're trying to focus on one diagnosis, the query, when really and proactively we should be focusing on uh, the doctor understanding and appreciating and adhering to putting our thoughts about what are the provisional diagnoses. So the undisputable goal of CDI is to achieve documentation excellence. And REDS, if the racketeur means the thing speaks for itself, it should be uh, the, uh, anyone can pick up the chart and knows exactly what's happening, how the diagnosis arrived at, and so forth. So on slide number 37, uh, I just want to reiterate 
is effective communication and patient care, which we uh, alluded to earlier, uh, we're not looking for cliff notes. We're looking for facts of the case that start in the H&P and the ER. And on slide number 38, I, I remember uh, back in college or high school when I was taking uh, science uh, lab, uh, it's actually smell a whiff test. Does your document, should we as CDI be able to look at a chart and see whether it's passed with the whiff test? Do I have a previous admission and accurate and complete H&P? Do I have a, does the record tell the story? Does it show and describe a patient who's sick? No cliff notes. And does the progress notes demonstrate progress? And one thing that we're not looking at that I encourage uh, programs to be looking at for improvement is our discharge summary. Because the reviewers uh, oftentimes just review the discharge summary. They don't see a good clinical picture of a sick patient or don't see a diagnosis that impacts reimbursement uh, as a secondary diagnosis. They don't go any further. Uh, I've seen that time and time again. So one thing that we can definitely focus on is the quality of our discharge summary and the joint commission and the conditions of participation outline what's the, what are the elements of a discharge summary, and I'd be happy to share that. Okay, so how do we get started? Uh, how do we get started in transforming our program as, and, and really focusing on our goals and objectives? And the first is to, to really look at the five R's. We visit what we're doing, revise what we're doing, uh, we formulate our program and we brand it to our positions that it's not just a documentation improvement reimbursement, it actually impacts their uh, business of medicine and the patient suffers oftentimes because they don't, they may as a Medicare patient have higher, uh, they have co-pays for observation where there's only a one deductible for an inpatient and they've made, already made their deductible. So we want to re-engineer engineer our programs. And how do we do that? Well, we look at our, what I call the five measures of operation, operationalizing is to focus, structure, process, track, and train, and standardize. And I'm going to go. I'm kind of going to go through how do we how do we implement each of these elements. So let's look at our future investment of CDI. We want to be proactive and not reactive. And how do, and, and how we structure proactivity is to look at the chart in the ER and. Uh, and even really consider having a CDI person work in the ER. Obviously, you can't have one 24 hours a day, but certainly you could have uh, find when the biggest flow of patients and what's the biggest, what's the when, when what times of the day are where do we have more admissions volume-wise from the ER, and look at establishing a medical necessity because really there's no point in solidifying diagnoses that doesn't support the revenue cycle because we may get a diagnosis, but if we don't get paid. Uh, then, then the revenue cycle is really impacted. And if you look at, you look at a, uh, a recent study was done by Crow Horth, and it showed that uh, there's increasing patient financial responsibility. So not only are we uh, uh, for for inpatient and outpatient, and actually they showed that 23.3 percent uh, uh, percentage of the bill is paid now by uh, in 2015 and 2016 is 26.9 percent, and 10.2% was the patient responsibility uh, in 2015. It's now 12.1. Uh, so we have issues of collecting on that money. Then we introduce the concept of maybe not getting paid, so we don't have to worry about even get, trying to collect on that challenging reimbursement. Uh, we don't have, we don't get paid. So how do we establish medical necessity by looking at the H and P and looking at these elements? Uh, this should be a standard for our CDI. It's a number of acuity, severity, and duration of problems uh, that the diagnosed doctor uh, must ad address uh, in the uh, in the admission. There's the comorbidities. Are they clinically specific? Are they all relevant? Do we have them right up front? Do we have any issues of uh, previous management of clinical conditions, i.e., was the patient just discharged or presented to the ER a week ago with similar presentation? Did the patient have a uh, does the does the patient been managed as an outpatient, failed outpatient treatment for pneumonia. These things are very important, but we're not looking at it because we're looking at a chart 48 hours later. So getting a, getting a, positive, a proper perspective and getting ahead of the curve is uh, is taking an active approach. And that looks, that means looking at our ER, H&P, uh, and having a nice flow, organized, consistent, clear uh, uh, facts of the case that 
culminating in progress notes that tell us progress, and a discharge summary that actually tells exactly what happened with the patient. So, you know, one of the things I want to, uh, as we move forward, because we, we want to leave with ample time for questions and answers, any comments, is that uh, we know that the two midnight rule is is pretty uh, is somewhat uh, problematic, but it's really easier uh, to uh, to manage uh, in 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 the sense that it it says basically a patient uh, uh, the physician who expects that a patient may be uh, uh, will require uh, expectation that a patient will require at least two mid two days in the hospital for the hospital level of care and there's a presumption and benchmark. Well, it's all based on one thing. It's not what the, it's not, it's not what the doctor knew after the fact. It's what the doctor knew before the fact, uh, which is which is vested in various uh, publications of Medicare, okay? And it's based on the Medicare tells us, and based on the duration of the medical factors, medical history and comorbidity, severity of signs and symptoms, current medical needs, and risk of adverse event. Well, we're not doing a very good job in most instances of capturing that information. Well, our documentation improvement and with the help of our physician advisors can certainly have a strong impact in supporting the revenue cycle. And it doesn't require an attestation form. So I want to give an example. This was an actual case that was denied. Uh, let's look at it. Okay. These are some of the statements that I received, that I, uh, I found in the chart that led to the denials. Okay. First admission. First note. Patient dynamically stable with no complaints. Well, anybody's going to say, what's the patient doing there? Another one, uh, a different case, a doctor wrote a acute respiratory failure as a secondary, which was, which was suspect, and the only major CC, which in enhanced reimbursement, not allowed by the insurance company. Patient alert in ORN times three and no rest, rest incompletely and no distress. Well, obviously there's an incongruency that uh, needs to be taken back to the physician in a non-threatening way. Uh, and here's another one, H&P that says, we're at MI, patient chest pain free now. Well, this, this doesn't show any reason for admission on a, and doesn't show that the physician reasonable, we can show the reasonable expectation of the two midnight. So these are like, these are like kiss of death uh, and they're, they're avoidable. Okay, so uh, we, went, we went over that. Let's see. We went over that. Okay, here, here's, here's another denial. This is an actual case. Uh, abdominal pain, cute on chronic, the plan of care is admit the patient for further workup and management, start medications, order radiology, order consult and see orders. Well, this is, uh, unfortunately, when we usually send in a chart, we don't necessarily, to be reviewed, we don't necessarily send in the orders. Okay, so that's a detriment. And so obviously this does not meet the standard of, an, uh, of a clinical judgment because there is no, there's no, the, the initiation of action congruent with the assessment. I don't know what the, uh, I don't know what radiology reports, uh, tests he's ordering. I don't know what the consults are and why. Why is he, why, what is he thinking? So obviously this is a documentation issue that we can, uh, we can address through our CDI program. So I want to kind of close with this uh, in, uh, we have just a couple of slides and open it up. Uh, so let's look at our current state of affairs. Okay, uh, I came up with this concept of this pizza now, and I figured because it's lunchtime, maybe you want to have pizza for lunch. But in any case, uh, a pizza is only as good as all the ingredients in the pizza. So I could have a pizza that has uh, import, uh, four types of cheeses. I could have imported pepperoni. I could have uh, homemade sauce with no uh, with no artificial ingredients or corn, uh, high fructose corn syrup, really first class. But I use a frozen crust. Okay, so it detracts from the from the delicacy of the pizza. Let's look at a medical record in the same format. If we have uh, good quality care and we have the and we have the pepperoni, which is our diagnosis, <coughs> uh, and we get and we are able to build a higher potentially higher level reimbursement uh, DRG, uh, and more, a lot of payers pay on DRG, <coughs> or we, are we, we, end, we end up with more specific diagnoses like aspiration pneumonia. Well, we don't have the clinical facts of the case uh, which we, uh, and the clinical information well orchestrated in our H&P and our progress notes that's consistent, clear, and concise then we have an inferior chart from the standpoint of revenue integrity. And this is exactly what's happening today 
is we're getting diagnosis and running thinking we're doing a good job, but at the end of the day, it's not supporting revenue integrity today uh, in terms of risk, particularly that encephalopathy or any major CC or any of those diagnoses or DIGs I showed. And it has trailing impact because you can get paid this year and have to get back the money next year. And if you look at the, the, the delay, if you look at the delay, if you look at the delay in the, uh, in the, in the uh, administrative large judge, average of 544 day wait, uh, and now um, uh, CMS has been ordered by the courts to clear up the backlog by 2020. That's a long time from now. Uh, and if you think about the cost of denials, uh, uh, AHA estimated, I think last year, that it cost about $5,000 to uh, um, the, the time value of money and the, and the uh, effort and cost to appeal. Uh, well, right off the bat, it cost me $5,000 just to appeal cases that, sh that could have been avoided. So in closing, I want to look at the crossroad. What's the current CDI? And uh, as it's retrospective, it's reactionary, it has a narrow focus, it's limited scope of increasing reimbursement, which should be an outcome of our process improvement. And we have a cliff note style of synopsis where we should be looking at and proactive. We should be anticipatory. We should be getting feedback on denials and taking action to improve documentation, learning from our oversights. Uh, the third thing is, uh, what are the clinical facts, what is known, uh, what, is, what is known uh, when a doctor admitted the patient, and expand our scope, start in the ER, and we should really be focused on an action-packed drama story. And what's that mean? Well, the meat of the story and what's the conclusion? What do we start out with? Do we have a good body, just like a book? And do we have a good closing in our last chapter? Uh, I just want to say one thing. I had slide number 65 I wanted to show. Okay. Okay, we went over that. Okay, here's a good case study I might have on the slide number 55. Uh, I wanted to say one more thing, if I could find it here. Okay. Let me see where it is. Hold on. Sorry. Let's see. Okay, a couple things. We want to, okay, so when you go back to your facilities, a couple of homework assignments. Uh, you want to kind of look at what's my denial volume and rate, medical necessity denials, clinical validation denials, what are our DRG down codes, uh, did we win, what's our percentage of uh, appeals, how many did we appeal, and what percentage did we win, how estimate the cost to, uh, to appeal them. Uh, and what's our overturn rate for medical necessity denials, clinical validation denials, DRG town codes, and what's our cost to appeal? And if you look at the, if you look at two things here, the sufficient sufficient documentation. If we focus truly on the communication of patient care from the beginning, uh, everything else uh, will will fall into place. Really, medical necessity will be taken care of. Uh, UR UM can do its job more effectively. Uh, we have uh, we have the data or information necessary to translate codes, uh, diagnosis into codes that show quality outcomes. I'm a coder by trade, and I want to be able to pick up a chart and be able to assign the code accurately, uh, uh, effectively, and, uh, and have a good appreciation that these codes will stand the test of time. Uh, we have reimbursement that uh, that stands the test of time and reduces our ultimate immediate risk and our trailing impact. And we show the good outcomes. And I'm going to close with slide number 50, uh, 59. So what should be our standard? This should be our standard for our CDI. And I practice CDI on a regular basis. So I'm looking at this standard and saying, OK, other physicians should be able to review the physician author note and assume care. And this is the element. Do I have past and current diagnoses? Do I have a good handle of the current patient's problems? Do I, can I match up the treatments and plan of care with the patient's problems? Do I have a planned workup that's well described? I showed you a case where it wasn't. Uh, do I have my rationale, judgment, medical decision making, thought processes, and problem solving skills? Do I have an assessment that tells me exactly what I'm thinking? What are the diagnoses? What are the potential diagnoses? What am I ordering and why? And do I have justification for my follow-up care? Do I, have, do I have a good picture of the patient's needs by the end of the stay so I can, as a discharge planner, can confidently call the insurance company and justify a SNP admission? And do I have justification for diagnostic workup and therapeutic treatments? Because obviously, 
uh, cost of care is going to become more important when I when I uh, I'm impacted by shared decision making and game sharing. And the last, and the, you know, one thing that ultimately we should be looking for is understanding that this came from Medicare, uh, 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 a book that it just came out, like a Dear John letter to doctors called Care for is a Partnership. And what it's really saying is, is that. Uh, the doctors have a duty to understand the Medicare coverage criteria and the documentation to uh, uh, to impact the coverage criteria. And uh, outside auditors, not only from a hospital but physician standpoint, uh, conduct audits based on the variable documentation. And so if you're finding that more and more documentation lacks information to establish medical necessity, which the doctor completely controls, not the insurance company. And I put this in, in highlight because this lack of documentation on the physician part is causing a lack of payment for the services and the potential to cause patients harm. So the patient, uh, uh, if it's a Medicare patient, uh, they may they may they, they may have uh, uh, they may get a premature discharge, or the or the doctor uh, uh, may write a discharge uh, order that's that may not stand up if they if this. Uh, if the patient challenges it with the BFCC, so it really it, it creates a lot of ill will. And uh, and I uh, and I and right here, I have my uh, I have my uh, uh, email. I changed my email to my personal email for so I make sure I get them. So if you have any questions, please use that email. And I have uh, I have my cell phone there. And I want and the appendix has some really good information about supporting medical necessity. And let's see if there's any questions. Comments, complaints, suggestions. So at this time, if anyone has questions, you are free to submit those via the chat box. And we will address those with Glenn so that everyone else can hear them as well. So Glenn, we had a question come through just to confirm that there were only two polling questions. We had a couple more. Did you want to address oh, yeah, either? Oh, okay, yeah, let's go, let's go ahead and do those to close. Okay. Of those? You, go ahead. Absolutely. So we'll launch this one. Does your facility have any active plans to expand CDI into the outpatient arena? That's a pretty easy question, isn't it? It is. Getting any answers? We are. We have about 83% voted, so I'll give it another 10, 15 seconds to see if anyone okay. else responds, and then I'll share those responses with you. All right, I'm going to close that and let you address those well, responses. Well, 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 okay, Looks like 40% okay. said yes, 30% said no, and 30% okay. said unsure. Okay, well, that's about what I had thought because, and I just want to give you uh, just a brief, very, very brief overview of outpatient CDI. Outpatient CDI, some facilities are thinking, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm certainly not saying this is not a good good starting point, but they're looking for HCCs, health, uh, high hierarchy condition categories that in the Medicare Advantage and some of the other payers, and Medicare uses for their, uh, for their, ACOs and so forth for adjusting payments and risk and 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 cost uh, and target cost target price for cost uh, and reimbursements uh, uh, is it should not be the ultimate standard that we're using. We should be starting looking at outpatient CDI from the standpoint of improving documentation as uh, in the and starting in the doctor's office because if you look at all the care that's provided in the outpatient besides a mammogram, screening mammogram, there's no service that Medicare uh, will cover without an order. And the order begins in the doctor's office. So if you really, truly want to impact uh, outpatient CDI, think, start thinking about, OK, if I own practices, this is where outpatient CDI begins. Because payers are looking not only at the order, they're looking at the rationale that the doctor uh, 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 used to cut, to order that CT scan, or to order the MRI, or, or to order the Remicade. These are high uh, Remicade, IVIG, high, very very high cost drugs, and I'm seeing too many denials of medical necessity because the doctor did not substantiate their by documentation his rationale. There are certain requirements for these high cost drugs, uh, conservative therapy. If it's not in the chart, you don't get payment. So, do we have time for one more? 
We absolutely do. So let me hide that question. Okay. And okay. launch the last one. Got Does your CDI program currently leverage technology to manage and optimize the medical record chart review process? Yes, no, or unsure? And this, and this is a good one to close on, really good. Looks like we're getting closer to everybody voting. Give them another okay. 10, 15 seconds. And the answer is? The, an the answer is? Door number oh, one. 50% say yes, 28% yes. say no, and 22% say unsure. Okay, you know, I'm just going to close with this. Thank you folks for listening. Really appreciate it. Uh, and that's, uh, I just want to uh, say that's great that people are using technology to uh, help uh, improve the efficiencies of our CDI program because we obviously don't want to be spend a lot of time uh, hunting for records that don't have opportunity for improvement. Just keep in mind that uh, those technology programs are designed, and uh, I'm not, not trying to be negative, just a couple of cautions. One of them is it's designed to enhance efficiency, which I, I'm all for. The, uh, the limitation it is it's only looking at records that, uh, use, and they usually use natural language processing to identify opportunities for improvement, such as type of heart failure, uh, and whether the patient has respiratory failure and so forth. The downside is uh, we're still only focusing on getting those diagnoses without impacting positive change in the, uh, in the behavior of the documentation uh, to the extent the clinical information facts and the content are very solidified, clearly delineated. So you still risk the you still have the opportunity or a chance of risk and trailing and the risk immediate risk and the trailing impact. So please don't, please remember that uh, uh, it's only designed to, to en enhance the reimbursement. We still must take those cases and look at them uh, from the standpoint of holistically looking and getting the facts of the case uh, uh, well orchestrated and described. So uh, we support the revenue cycle. So I, I think that was a good closing uh, uh, survey question. And like I said, please, if you have any questions or comments uh, after the event here, uh, I'm more than happy, I'm willing, I will respond to every one of them. Glenn, thank you so much for being with us today. And at this time, that concludes our webinar. Okay, thank you very much. Have a good day, everyone.